Ukraine's ATO headquarters has recorded 20 ceasefire violations overnight. Three soldiers of Ukraine's army were wounded. Russian-backed separatist forces fired 120 mm mortars into Chermolik and Shirokine, 82 mm mortars into Krasnohorivka. Militant snipers were operating in the direction of Novotroitske. Grenade launchers and small arms were applied near Lebedinsky, Slavne and Pavlopi. In the Donetsk sector, occupational forces shelled 152 and 122 mm artillery against Vodyane village. Avdiyuka and Luhansky were attacked with armored personal carrier weapons, grenade launchers and large caliber machine guns. Weasel liberalization hopes are higher than ever. One step closer, the major EU institutions have come to an agreement on the visa free suspension mechanism in cases of emergencies. It was the main obstacle within the EU that has prevented a visa free regime to be voted by the European Parliament. The decision was confirmed by the Permanent Representatives Committee of the EU Council. And today, the suspension mechanism was approved by the European Parliament Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. The EU Parliament vote for visa abolition for Ukrainians may take place in mid-January 2017. The meeting of around 50 foreign ministers of OSCE countries has started today in Germany. Before the session opening, Ukraine's foreign ministry Pavlo Klinkin stated that Russia blocks all efforts in reaching progress on Donbas conflict settlement. In particular, about an our admission of the OSCE in eastern Ukraine remaining as a fact, with a low probability to happen. Even if we fail here in Hamburg to solve all the conflicts and all crisis situations during the conference, it's highly important we all unite to enhance OSCE instruments of solving conflicts. We should all be Europeans, rather than just the EU, seeking a dialogue. The ceasefire regime in Donbass is constantly violated. Until there is no political will, any mission, even totally armed, won't be able to bring peace. But there is no will of the Russian party even for a final declaration of the conference. We don't need empty promises. We'll just work further and longer. Since January the 1st, 2017, Austria takes presidency in the OSCE, and the Austrian foreign minister wants to visit Donbass within the first weeks of the new year. A Ukrainian ship is named by Ihor Momot. This is the first time in Ukrainian history when a civilian ship is named by a border guard hero. Momot was a colonel in the Ukrainian army who died protecting the country from Russian aggression two years ago. Before Crimea was annexed and the Donbas conflict arose, Ihor Momot was the head of Ismail border unit in the Odessa region. When ATO started, he went to the east to fight for Ukraine. Ihor Momot was killed during a grudge shelling. Welcome to Ukraine Today, my name is Teres Chechko. At the moment I'm joined by Graham Meadows, he's a former Director General of the Directorate for Regional and Urban Policy of the European Commission. Uh, Mr. Meadows, it's a great pleasure to have you here. So, um, if we talk about urban development, can we say that a key element of, uh, of a perfect development of the whole country lies in a, in a very planned regional policy? 
Yeah, you have to be careful with the word planned because it sounds like some form of world which we're all trying to get away from. Absolutely. But the idea is that if you don't actually think about what you're trying to do and draw in all of the different elements which are available, if you don't think like that, then you don't really achieve the potential that is available to you. If you, for example, think about investments in industry, but you don't think about the training of the, and the qualities of the qualifications of the working people, then you may find that when you are looking for people who will weld pipes, you don't have these people available and you have to bring them in from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about everything at the same time. So you have to have some kind of overall vision or strategy or plan. But I realize that the word plan has rather heavy connotation. Uh, if, we, uh, if we switch to the trends and innovations, they were one of the uh, topics of the panels. So what are major trends uh, actually in uh, regional policy right now? Well, the major trend is always how do you best put together the two elements which are first of all in investing in let's say creating work spaces so places where people can work vacancies and then how do you train the people to actually fill the vacancies because everybody says we must create employment but if you think about employment it's really two things at the same time it's a vacancy a vacancy in which someone can work so for you it's the place where you work in the in the in the information company and then it's a qualified person who can fill that vacancy like you working in the in the company so you need to make sure that you've got the right people for the vacancies that you're creating and that is always a drama it's always difficult because of course we don't know what's happening in the future, you have um, recessions and that means that you, you sometimes get the wrong people in the right places or the right jobs in the wrong places and so on. So it, it, that takes a great deal of time and a great deal of effort. So what do you do in the situation if, uh, if the mayor, let's say that, uh, he becomes, he gets that position and he says that, uh, I'm sorry, but like in my city, uh, there is almost no production. It's the city that lives uh, through, through people work in, uh, in different cities or even different countries and bringing money there. So what, uh, what should we say to such mayors and, and say to them what should they do uh, in the city that has such a situation? But the, I think the key element always is the quality of the administration. In the, we heard somebody say this morning that if I'm an inward, if I'm a, an investor looking for a place to come in Ukraine, I don't want to wait for months while somebody gets the right certificates. I was going out of Kiev a month or so ago and I sat on the plane next to, I was going back to Brussels in Belgium where I live and the, there was a Belgian in the seat next to me. He'd been in Ukraine for a week looking for a place to bring his company from Belgium, making specialist tires, and he employed about 20 people. And he went around Belgium, uh, went around Ukraine, west and east, and he decided he would put his uh, factory in Macedonia. After all that? After all that, now why? Because I think he felt he didn't, the, the uh, sort of uh, administrations he came into contact with couldn't somehow give him the confidence to bring his factory here and it's so this confidence that we're looking to create is a rather fragile thing and the in one of the big projects that for example that i was uh, interested in a long time ago which was the creation of a new factory making microprocessors you can see how long ago it was for siemens the local authorities so the mayor were, met the people from Siemens and he set up a, um, a, fa a, a unit in his administration to help the people from Siemens who were going to come to manage to find schools for their children, to help them find the houses that they wanted and to generally uh, make it 
attractive for these people to come. So, and this is all organization. So th the mayor that you spoke about who says, oh dear, I've got no work in my place, he has to sort of pick himself up, dust himself down, look at his organization and say, what do I need to do to actually organize the growth in my place? Innovation, for example. When you talk about innovation, people think that somehow it comes from heaven that you're walking around and suddenly, pow, uh, an innovation falls on your head and you think, oh gosh, this is great, a uh, great innovation. Innovation is organized. Invention is different, but innovation is organized. It's a question of organizing things so that people see what's uh, new, see what's beneficial, and have a way of bringing it in and spreading it out very, very quickly. So the quality of the mayor's organization in his own town, in his own Cremada, is extremely important. And he's got to try to make that as modern as he possibly can. How do you estimate the recent establishment of the uh, Ukraine Investment Promotion Office? Is it a real institution that can uh, help inv foreign investors to overcome those obstacles they can face in Ukraine? Or actually it's just like a facade which is, uh, which is just hiding all those uh, faults that are already in the country but not, uh, not uh, cutting them off. So what do you think about this office? Well, I think that with, I think you need it. If you look at all big, uh, if you look at all countries which are attracting lots of investment, they all have an office which uh, helps them to present themselves to the rest of the world. And I think that you need in the office an expertise which, which uh, is sensitive to the needs of inward investors. So now then, uh, these offices get set up, and of course it takes time for them to sort of be, to be thoroughly well working, to understand where the, the, uh, the markets are for them, what their specialities are that they can sell. And of course they have to also feed back into you Ukraine, the, what international investors are saying, we, we, we're we not finding such and such a thing, or we are finding. So it, I think you couldn't manage, you cannot manage without it. If this Belgian that I told you about, who'd been in the plane, had actually come into contact with the right person, and that person had said, let me take you by the hand, I can take you to exactly where you need to go, perhaps he wouldn't be going to Macedonia, perhaps he'd be coming here. So I find that you... Uh, I think I find it's an extremely necessary function and uh, over time it becomes more and more efficient simply because it learns more and more about what it is that the world is looking for in Ukraine and what Ukraine can offer the rest of the world. Absolutely, I agree with you. Today, uh, Prime Minister Groisman, he said that uh, he strongly supports the idea of decentralization in Ukraine. So, uh, is, uh, is this process progressing in a good, good path as, uh, as, as it is expected? Or actually it uh, lacks some uh, progress? What do you think about that? I'm strongly of the view that, um, that it'll take a generation to change the attitudes of government in Ukraine because you can make a law which says we're going to amalgamate Kramadas and we're going to do all of this, that and the other, we're going to pass health care down from one level to the next and then down. You can pass all the laws, but the laws are only as it were firing the starting gun to say now we begin. You're trying to change attitudes, you're trying to change the way that people think about and act. Uh, and act. And my what I say to people who ask me about it in Ukraine, and this is, I find, Ukraine's big challenge. Time in Ukraine is different from time anywhere else, strangely enough. If you were in the European Union or you're in the United States, if you say, I'll do that next year or I'll do that in two years' time, you can be fairly confident that it, when the two years are up, you'll be in a position to do it. But here you have the problem in the East. You have uh, uh, a security in the country which is protected by all sorts of fragile arrangements. You have a public who have been disappointed so many times for so many years about the, the big change that they're waiting for.
the revolution of dignity continues. Watch the birth of a new nation online at uatoday.tv.